The biggest joke is that me and your lovely wife here have been having an affair behind your back. He's drunk. Oh. 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 No, it's what Come I here, want! Come here! Come here! Leave it alone! Yeah. Coronation Street, home to Mike, the master of the machinists, right then, and his well, cocky, well, troublesome well, tribe, the Baldwins. To the Baldwin clan. They know everything about business affairs, but even more about family affairs. Over the years, the Baldwins have discovered that it's tough at the top, but even tougher when they hit rock bottom. You've got to be ruthless. You've got till lunchtime to get me my money back, or leave Weatherfield. You've got to have a lot of guts. Life's a gamble. I still have that little bit of charm with the ladies. <laughs> Mike Baldwin, pleased to meet you. <laughs> if you're going to be in a family, it's got to be in the Baldwins. Me and your lovely wife here have been having an affair behind your back. They keep the Weatherfield women in work and throw in the odd bit of overtime themselves. They're a rum bunch, aren't they, the Baldwins? <laughs> yes, whether they're catching up with old friends, <laughs> enjoying a run out in the car, <laughs> or spending some quality time with the family. <laughs> Those Baldwins have learned to face all their problems head on. So join us as we take a butcher's hook. Get out! The Baldwin family album. They're out for everything that they can get. If there's a Baldwin family more, it would have to be look after number one. Which is just as well, because back in 1976, before his cockney rabble descended on him, Mike was flying the Baldwin flag on his own. Over the years, four women have applied for the vacant position of Bolshe Baldwin wife, but they didn't fulfil the job description. Contracts were terminated with a divorce. But there is one partnership that Mike has really poured his heart and soul into over the last 30 years. She keeps him in cigars, she keeps him in scotch, and she's managed to keep him interested in her knickers. Yes, it's his factory. There's always trouble at Mill, isn't there? And uh, and I think that the, the backdrop for a lot of the drama is Underworld. The factory floor has seen it all. Fires, fornicating and fighting. But that doesn't stop fans from wanting to get behind those famous machines. I get about eight or nine letters a week with people who want to be a machinist. Have you got any jobs down at that factory of yours for two bored but very beautiful ladies? And then I get about one a month of somebody very highly qualified asking if they could come and be my factory manager. And when it comes to who's going to get their hands on his knickers, Mike has shown he's very non-discriminating. In Mike's factory at the minute, there's heterosexual, homosexual, transsexual, I mean, you could say that he, he is an example of what an employer should be these days. He's very PC, he's very equal opportunities. And once you're in work, you'll find you can treat it like a bit of a holiday. How does he make his money? He's got maybe three or four machinists. He makes a couple of rather tatty T-shirts. I don't think between them they could make a pair of jeans. And now they're making the old pair of knickers. But don't be fooled into thinking it's a job for life. Just keep your heads down when uh, Mike Baldwin's about, cos he's in a firing mode. You're fired. Yeah. You're sacked. You're sacked. You're sacked. Mike Baldwin has said you're fired. You're fired. More times than Alan Sugar. I said to Julie Esmondos the other day, I play as Hayley, oh, I'm sacked again. <laughs> we just start laughing. You are sacked. You are? You are sacked. I think you're. Mike might be able to hire and fire who he pleases, but when it comes to his enemies, the power is very much out of his hands. Mike's famous enemy in the street is Kim Barlow. Mike, Baldwin, and Ken are diametrically opposed in almost every aspect of life. <laughs> came to a head over the uh, Ken Mike Deirdre situation, which was a clash waiting to happen. Ken's wife Deirdre was the surprise sex kitten who in 1982 started an affair with Mike the Maverick, instigating a feud between the two men. My place? Yeah. All right. And in February 1983, it would be Mike who would offer to take Deirdre away from her life of drudgery. Leave him. And then what? We 
get married. Faced with the prospect of shacking up with the king of the cross stitch or the king of the cardigan, Deirdre chose the cardigan. And it was a result which sparked an amazing reaction. It was that story that was flashed up on the screen in, uh, in Manchester United game saying Ken stays with Deirdre at half time. There was 21 million viewers that night. It hit a pulse like none of the soaps had ever hit before. Why did you put the phone down on me? It's Ken, he knows. I've told him everything. Just get Ken, out of this house. Get Shut it. up! Oh, I'm oh, warning you. Get out of this house. You go. Go. Ken might have won the battle, but the war was far from over. I've had the joy of thumping him <laughs> at least four or five times. And uh, I've actually got paid for it. Oh. It's one of the few times in the show when I've said, I hope they do another take. I remember one where I went to the office and I thumped him and he fell down. I've had enough of your poison in my family, more than enough. Look, oh. I would pay a charity. If they just write a few more episodes, I could hit him again. The ties that bind Ken and Mike would become even more tangled in 2001 when it was revealed that in addition to Mark, Mike had another son he never knew existed. Now pay attention at the back, this could take some time. Mike married Ken's daughter Susan in May 1986, but the marriage went down the plug hole. And she left him in 1987, claiming she'd had an abortion. You murdered my kid! Fast forward to 2001 and Susan pops her clogs, but not before it's revealed she's also dropped a sprog. After lying about the abortion all those years ago, the result was Adam Barlow, who, despite carrying the Barlow name, was actually Mike Baldwin's son. Don't be frightened, Adam! That we might be I'm your father. To his glorious body. Adam clearly delighted at the news there. When Adam came into the show, I remember seeing it and I was walking past the TV and I was like, who's that? His son? He's got another son? Couldn't believe it. Mike goes from having one son to two. I wonder what the CSA would have to say about that. How many sons have I got? They're coming out the trees. Mike Baldwin doesn't know half of his family. They just spring up from every nook and cranny. He's been a naughty boy in the past, hasn't he, really? He's spread his wild oats. By spreading his wild oats in the past, Mike would have to reap what he sowed in the present. Danny's more than just your nephew, Mike. He is your son. Looks like Mike managed to score a hat-trick. Mike Baldwin is the Picasso of soap. He will be fathering children until he's 192. Most sons borrow the dad's car or a couple of quid from time to time, but in 1999, when Mike's son Mark Baldwin returned, he borrowed something a lot more precious to Mike. Factory girl Linda Sykes. Well, Mark turns up after being away for quite a while, being at boarding school or whatever, and meets Linda. Mark, my uh, girlfriend, Linda. Mark? Linda, my son. As soon as Mark entered Mike's life, he was a very real rival. They say keep your friends close and your enemies closer, so Linda set out to keep Mark very close indeed. Why don't I come up? See if there's out up there needs a woman's touch. The first time uh, Linda and Mark kissed was New Year's Eve. It was uh, halfway through an argument. If I really was taking your dad to the cleaners, he'd be there by now, hung out and dry. I remember being thrown into a um, rack of clothes and ravished by Mark Baldwin. And whilst everyone else enjoyed the celebrations, Mark and Linda had their own little firework party, which certainly went off with a bang. It's not so bad, actually, as a young single actress, you know, being paid to snog a couple of men all day, but the novelty wears off pretty quick and it's like, oh yeah, Johnny, I'm snogging you again today. Or, Come on then, Paul, your turn. Oh, we had to do a lot of practice, yeah. We had to do a lot of practice to get the kissing right. I remember that his comment was actually, oh no, she's gonna taste like an ashtray. He was always complaining about my fag breath. Blissfully unaware that Linda was now factory seconds, Mike wanted nothing more than to make Linda the fourth Mrs Baldwin. I want you to be a partner in my life. For Linda, it's not just about the money, but it's about the, the status. Linda may have been attracted to Mike's money, but in the run-up to the wedding, it was Mark's packet that she kept getting her hands on. Hey. And so in September 2000, everything was in place for the biggest Baldwin bash Weatherfield had ever seen. Grand Country House, Nice whistle and flute, 
the cheating, money-grabbing, double-crossing gold digger. Yes, this certainly was going to be an affair to remember. Mike found out on his wedding day that his son was having an affair with his wife. Whilst Linda and Mike were getting spliced, the world's worst best man was getting sloshed, and before they'd had chance to consummate Very the marriage, the Mark show. dropped his bombshell. The biggest joke is that me and your lovely wife here have been having an affair behind your back. He's drunk. Get out! The father-son relationship is more important than any other relationship, that that betrayal is even worse. Realising his trouble and strife was literally just that, it was time for Mike to reinforce some traditional family values, the Baldwin way. Sorry, Mike, no! When we came to do the scene where uh, I had to get hold of Paul Fox, I had to thump him, put him in the shower. I'm sorry, Dad! And then thump it again. Mike! And I told him I was going to do this the night before, and uh, we arrived on the set the following morning. And I said, how are you, Paul? He said, I'm dreading today, Johnny. I said, you wait till the day's over. You'll dread it even more. So it would seem Mark walked away with more than just a bruised ego. And since the affair had been kept in the family, Mike thought it would be better for it to stay that way. At the end of the wedding, when Mike was saying, no one needs to know about this, he was doing what the Baldwins do best, which is, we're all right, and even if they're not all right, no one needs to know that. Heading off for a honeymoon in the sun, but with faces like thunder, you could always try the cafe. Go and put kettle on and have a nice cup of tea. Or maybe the chippy is the place to be. Can I have two meat and potatoes pies and a bag of chips, please, Chuck? Can I have two meat and potato pies and a bag of chips, please, Chuck? Can I have two meat and potato pies and a bag of chips, please, Chuck? Don't worry, Danny. I wasn't hungry anyway. The reactions to the Londoners, um, with the Northerners, are uh, they have different uh, expressions. They don't have yuppies up here. Hey, yuppies! That's what they have. There are differences in what people say up here and down south. Do you wear knickers? Of course I do. There may be differences in the local lingo, but when it comes to the language of love, those Baldwins are practically fluent. The Baldwins' love lives are like a roller coaster. And there was one bumpy ride that both Jamie and his own father, Dirty Danny, would take during May 2005. The relationship between Leanne and Jamie came about pretty much as soon as I entered the street. I think I was doing something like packing some clothes into an underworld van and think I had my top off or something. Oh, yeah. And she took a shine to him straight away. Leanne is a trouble causer and Frankie has seen this. Lay your hook and steer clear of my boy, you pasty slapper. Oh, shut it. You're just jealous because you're past it, Granny. Of you? I know your sort. Always got a spare pair of knickers in your handbag. I found out about the Love Triangle storyline. The way I find out about all storylines is when you're having a drink with the writers and you just buy them a couple of beers and then they let stuff slip. How do you two fancy a foursome sometime? <laughs> well, if anybody's up for it, my door's always open. And I think she saw in Danny that, you know, he had a little bit of a sparkle about him and he's a bit dangerous, whereas Jamie's quite a safe option. Tired of playing it safe, Leanne fancied playing it fast, loose and dangerous with her boyfriend's father. I've never really been out with a bloke of the more, you know, mature variety. That was definitely a green light for Danny Baldwin, without a doubt. Yeah, 100%. Oh, don't worry about that. With Leanne flashing her green lights, it was seatbelts on and all systems go for a family affair destined for a head-on collision. When I know that Jane and Bradley are, are filming a scene where they're in bed together, you do feel, God, that's horrible, and you do start feeling a bit sorry for yourself. Rupert said he felt a bit sorry for himself. Hi, babe. Well, he's got to get a grip. What are you talking about? It's a job, you nutter. Five months into the affair, Danny and Leanne were proving the family that plays together stays together. I, uh, I'd better go and see that chicken, and I? I don't want my uh, bird getting overheated. You can't keep a secret like that. You're going to get found out. And that's exactly what happened when desperate Dan was looking to hook up with loose Leanne. But he wasn't expecting his wife to be on the receiving end. Ah. Oh, good of you to answer, Lee. Thanks a lot, babe. I mean, here I am on my own. I've got the champagne on ice. I'm ready to rock. And by the way, I've had to pay over the odds for our special room. And all I can say is you wanted it yesterday. And whatever you're playing at, you want it now. They sent Leanne. It's me. 
Bob's your uncle. Caught red-handed. Being caught with his pants down, Danny exposed himself as the rat he really was. Frankie was determined to exterminate him from her life. Who cares what you want? Danny is quite clever. He could talk himself out of any situation. What's this? I'm trying to run a business here. But the gift of the gab wasn't going to help Danny explain to his own son that he'd been sleeping with his girlfriend. You still here, Carol? I'm impressed. The That's reveal cool. of the affair is stuck in a room with all the women who've been a part of his life and there's no way out. He's just got to confess, really, and, and tell all. Tell me! <laughs> there's no getting away from it. This guy's just a philanderer. Full stop. <laughs> the person I've been seeing sleeping. With Danny's dark secret finally seeing daylight, Jamie was left heartbroken and betrayed by the two people he thought he could trust the most. It would seem in Weatherfield those Baldwin men have no trouble in attracting women. Beth, can't do you for looking. I think women find the Baldwin men attractive because they're so very confident. Right our girls, nick us down, let's chat. We all like somebody who's a bit mean. We can't help it, we're attracted to the mean people. Get out of my life forever! That is a mean streak. Yet the Baldwin men still think they're little angels. Yeah. Mike Baldwin is God, isn't he? I mean, he's a good-looking young guy. Got all the girls that he fancies working in the factory for him. Oh! He's like God, he's got it made, isn't he? Oh. Don't be shy, I'm a pussycat, really! I think Mike's almost ready to retire as a sex symbol. He's kind of handed the crown down the generations to Danny and Jamie and Warren. So, with the crown firmly passed down, here's hoping the knickers in Weatherfield remain up. I think what's funny as well is that they spend their whole time making knickers for a living and then they spend their leisure time trying to get knickers off. <laughs> One other woman who found the Baldwin charm irresistible was cafe owner Alma Sedgwick. All about self? <laughs> she was witty, good looking, and bright, and for a time she suited Mike down to a T. Which is why her story was even more heartbreaking in May 2001, when she was faced with some devastating news. The biopsy has shown that you do have cancer of the cervix. I've had an enormous, enormous responsibility. I just thought this is in so many people's lives. Whilst Alma tried to come to terms with the enormity of her illness, her best friend Audrey was on hand to give her all the support she needed. You mustn't give up. I mean, the papers, the television, every day they're full of people who've been told exactly what you've been told and they go on for years. Yes, but I'm sorry, Audrey, I don't believe in miracles. Although it shouldn't be all doom and gloom on a soap, we're not kind of teachers to it. doesn't hurt once in a while to take these issues. Faced with the daunting prospect of continuous radiotherapy treatment, Alma made one of the biggest decisions of her life. That I'm not going to have any more radiotherapy. No, no, you can't do that. Look, it'll, it's the only thing that'll keep you going, no, Alma. Yeah, look, just, just please. I mean, I may not have any choice about dying. But at least this way, I'll know I've squeezed every moment out of life I can. Within a month, Alma's condition had quickly deteriorated, and in June, it brought her and Mike together again for one final moment. Oh, that's look awful. No. You look fine. You look perfect. When we did the scene where Amanda died, and we all had to sit on this bed, and we were so crowded, she could hardly breathe. Poor girl. Do you remember when they used to have those um, competitions, how many people could get into a telephone box? How many people could get onto Alma's deathbed? There was a natural sadness when she died because it was Amanda leaving. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's gone. <laughs> With Alma at peace, it was left to Mike and Audrey to carry out her final wish. You were the best friend in the world. When we did shake the ashes, the wind blew it right back in our faces. Bye, Alma. Could have looked like Dick Van Dyke as the chimney sweeper Mary Poppins. <laughs> it was Alma's revenge. Alma's death has been just one of the many emotional traumas that Mike Baldwin has had to cope with over the years. 
Bristol But even the mightiest of men can lose their grip sometimes, and in May 2005, it would seem that Mike's hold on life was starting to loosen. You don't mind Adam moving in, do you? No. Makes us feel like a proper family. Why don't we ask him to go to Spain with us, eh? He did. Remember? Yeah. Alzheimer's is a terrible thing, the way it cuts people down. And the more dynamic and egotistical and strong-minded a character is, the more they are brought down by something like Alzheimer's. So Mike is really a good character for that story. And over Christmas dinner, when Mike inquired after his dead brother, it was apparent his forgetfulness was getting worse. Where's Harry? Park in the car. Mike. Honey, we've been waiting ages to eat. And I know Harry likes his grub. Mike Baldwin being such a powerful character, people love to hate him. To watch him deteriorate is very moving. I think I'm losing my mind. <laughs> what are on your so as Mike begins to realise the enormity of his problem, it would seem the future for the Baldwins is going to be a tough one. With their thriving business and even more than thriving love lives, this family have certainly put the win into Baldwin. But what advice would they give to anyone thinking of jumping on that Baldwin bandwagon? Once you're in, you're in. You stay loyal. Happy birthday! Hire a private detective instantly, just to make sure what the b****s were doing. Watch your back. <laughs> and make sure you've got thick skin. You're going to need it.